everyone, this is Miss Q, and we're gonna get ready to read the stories of the Black Ships Before Troy, Story of the Iliad, and as you can see behind me, we have the Judgment of Paris, a very, very vital scene, which you will learn about as we read. Hopefully you've already read this lecture, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you guys so you can see an introduction to the Greek gods, okay? I gotta grab mercy. So right now, as you can see, the story that we will be reading is The Black Ships Before Troy, the story of the Iliad. I'm gonna go ahead and read that introduction for you guys so we can get started. Rosemary Sutcliffe was a well-known British children's author and reteller of myths and legends. She spent her childhood in Malta and on other naval bases where her father was a naval officer. Sutcliffe was chronically ill from a very young age and confined to a wheelchair for most of her life. Her mother, a great oral storyteller, told Rosemary many legends and myths of their native Britain. 
Sutcliffe wrote her first novel in 1950 and never stopped. She was still writing on the morning of her death. Can you imagine having all that? passion to just write and write and write it must be incredible. So let's get started. Black Ships Before Troy, the story of the Iliad, myth by Rosemary Sutcliffe. The goal A myth is a traditional story that attempts to answer basic questions about human nature, origins of the world, mysteries of nature, or social customs. And myths involve many immortal gods and goddesses who, according to the ancient Greeks, lived on top of Mount Olympus, like we just saw. Golden Apple. In the high and far-off days when men were heroes and walked with the gods, Peleus, king of the Myrmidons, took for his wife a sea nymph called Thetis, Thetis of the Silver Feet. Many guests came to their wedding feast, and among the mortal guests came all the gods of high Olympus. But as they sat feasting, one who had not been invited was suddenly in their midst. Eris, the goddess of discord, had been left out because wherever she went, she took trouble with her. Yet here she was, all the same, and in her blackest mood, to avenge the insult. Okay, so let's break down what we just read, okay? What are some elements of Greek mythology, and what, how do we know that the conflict begins here? So, the characters that we have here are heroes, gods, and goddesses, they're all mentioned. You have Thetis of the Silver Feet, Peleus, King of Myrmidons, all that. Heroes were important because they were like gods. Kings were rulers. Humans might marry non-humans, such as nymphs. Gods and mortals might interact with each other. So this is elements of a Greek myth, okay? What is our conflict, however? Eris wasn't invited to the feast, the goddess of discord. If you guys remember, you should have known what discord is, which is a disagreement, tension, or strife. Okay, there it is. So, Eris was not invited to the feast. She will be angry. She is the goddess of discord. So, let's think about that for a second. What double-edged sword are these people living in? If you invite the goddess of discord, there's going to be a problem. If you don't invite her, she's going to be upset. And there's going to be another problem. What do you do? These poor Greek gods. Let's keep on reading. All she did, it seemed a small thing, was to toss down on the table a golden apple. Then she breathed upon the guests once and vanished. The apple lay gleaming among the piled fruits and the brimming wine cups, and bending close to look at it, everyone could see the words, To the fairest, traced on its side. Then the three greatest of the goddesses each claimed that it was hers. Hera claimed it as wife to Zeus, the All-Father, and queen of all the gods. Athene claimed that she had the better right, for the beauty of wisdom such as hers surpassed all else. Aphrodite only smiled and asked who had a better claim to beauty's prize than the goddess of beauty herself. They fell to arguing among themselves. The argument became a quarrel, and the quarrel grew more and more bitter, and each called upon the assembled guests to judge between them. But the other guests refused, for they knew well enough that, whichever goddess they chose to receive the golden apple, they would make enemies of the other two. In the end, the three took the quarrel home with them to Olympus. The other gods took sides, some with one and some with another, and the ill will between them dragged on for a long while. More than long enough in the world of men, for a child born when the quarrel first began— to grow to manhood and become a warrior or a herdsman. But the immortal gods do not know time as mortals know it. So we're going to take a pause right there. So let's review what just happened. So in Greek mythology, the gods and goddesses possess superhuman abilities, okay? But they also have very human emotions. 
and shortcomings. And sometimes their human qualities can be their arguments or conflicts between them. Can you imagine? You're God. You have nothing to worry about. And you're concerned about this apple and who was the fairest, but you're a God. See how that works? That's those human qualities that we have here. So if we reread lines 17 to 35, we see that there is a conflict between Hera, Athene, and Aphrodite. So each goddess believes that the apple, as the fairest, is rightfully hers. They take this quarrel home with them and other gods get involved. Eris, the goddess of discord, dropped an apple. She said, I'm gonna drop the mic right here and caused a scene, a riot, okay? And this is very human-like because they're arguing over something so small, so trivial to them and that they can be vain and envious and vengeful. This is typical, okay? Now, if we look at lines 32 to 35, we're going to see that their actions of the gods help us explain the plot events. So it says, more than long enough in the world for, of men for a child born when the quarrel first began to grow to manhood and became a warrior or herdsman, but the immortal gods do not know time as mortals do. Let's take a look at that. They don't know time as mortals know it. The quarrel had gone on for so long, this issue about who's the fairest of them on, who's gonna eat this apple, that you had a whole child, birth, grown, became a warrior, a whole lifetime, an entire lifetime, arguing over an apple. You tell me. Know it. Now on the northeast coast of the Aegean Sea, there was a city of men. Troy was its name, a great city surrounded by strong walls and standing on a hill hard by the shore. It had grown rich on the tolls that its kings demanded from merchant ships, passing up the nearby straits to the Black Sea cornlands and down again. Priam, who was now king, was lord of wide realms and long-maned horses, and he had many sons about his hearth. And when the quarrel about the golden apple was still raw and new, a last son was born to him and his wife, Queen Hecuba, and they called him Paris. There should have been great rejoicing, but while Hecuba still carried the babe within her, the soothsayers had foretold that she would give birth to a firebrand that should burn down Troy. Let's see what just happened. She's going to give birth to someone who will burn down Troy. That's problematic, if you will. Let's keep reading. And so, when he was born and named, the king bade a servant carry him out into the wilderness and leave him to die. The servant did as he was bid, but a herdsman searching for a missing calf found the babe and brought him up as his own. The boy grew tall and strong and beautiful the swiftest runner and the best archer in all the country around. So his boyhood passed among the oak woods and the high hill pastures that rose toward Mount Ida, and there he met and fell in love with a wood nymph called Enoni, who loved him in return. She had the gift of being able to heal the wounds of mortal men, no matter how sorely they were hurt. Among the oak woods they lived together and were happy, until one day the three jealous goddesses, still quarreling about the golden apple, chanced to look down from Olympus and saw the beautiful young man herding his cattle on the slopes of Mount Ida. They knew, for the gods know all things, that he was the son of Priam, king of Troy, though he himself did not know it yet. But the thought came to them that he would not know who they were, and therefore he would not be afraid to judge between them. They were growing somewhat weary of the argument by then. So they tossed the apple down to him, and Paris put up his hands and caught it. After it, the three came down, landing before him so lightly that their feet did not bend the mountain grasses, and bade him choose between them which was the fairest and had best right to the prize he held in his hand. 
First Athene, in her gleaming armor, fixed him with sword-gray eyes and promised him supreme wisdom if he would name her. Then Hera, in her royal robes as queen of heaven, promised him vast wealth and power and honor if he awarded her the prize. Lastly, Aphrodite drew near, her eyes as blue as deep sea water, her hair like spun gold wreathed around her head, and smiling honey-sweet, whispered that she would give him a wife as fair as herself if he tossed the apple to her. Okay, so there's a lot going on right now. Let's go back a little bit. So here we have Paris. He's all grown, a beautiful, strong dude. In line 61 to 75. A common element in myths is there are interactions with gods and humans. Excuse me, gods and mortals, okay? They can be positive interactions. They can be negative interactions. I know y'all have seen a lot of movies and read a lot of stories. It is safe to say that this might not be the best outcome, especially if we remember correctly, those soothsayers say that he's going to be the firebrand of Troy. Okay, so in line 61 to 75, why do you think the goddesses decided to ask Paris this? In line 69 to 70, we see that they are weary of their argument and want to settle it. They are bored. They are over it. They are done talking about this apple and who it belongs to, okay? So it's safe to say it's going to be a positive interaction, maybe? Or a negative one? I, I don't think it's going to be a good one because regardless of whoever he chooses, the other two goddesses he doesn't choose are going to be furious, furious that they're not the fairest of them all. Now, why did they choose Paris? We'll never know, but they did. Let's keep on reading, okay? Here we have this beautiful picture. It looks like a theme to me because of the helmet armor we've got going on there. You know what I mean? And Paris forgot the other two with their offers of wisdom and power, forgot also, for that moment, dark-haired Enoni in the shadowed oak woods, and he gave the golden apple to Aphrodite. Then Athene and Hera were angry with him for refusing them the prize, just as the wedding guests had known that they would be, and both of them were angry with Aphrodite. But Aphrodite was well content, and set about keeping her promise to the herdsman who was a king's son. Let's stop right there for a second. So you guys know what a theme is. A message about life or human nature that the writer shares with the reader. A theme isn't typically stated directly in the text, but you gotta figure it out for yourself. So one way to determine a myth's theme is to summarize or retell important events. Let's look at lines 86 to 94. So what could possibly happen about his choice? Paris chooses Aphrodite as the fairest. She's very pleased by this, but Hera and Athene are angry with both him and Aphrodite. So now we have another problem. He picks Aphrodite, the most beautiful one, right? The other two are gonna be angry. And then what themes or messages do we have about life that might have been taught through the ancient Greeks because of this myth? Um, men are often swayed by beauty because he chose Aphrodite, the prettiest one, right? You cannot please all the gods. No matter what you do, you cannot make them all happy. Clearly. And it's not a good idea to anger the gods. He gonna learn today. All right, let's finish that up. She put a certain thought into the heads of some of King Priam's men, so that they came cattle raiding at the full of the moon and drove off Paris's big beautiful herd bull, who was lord of all his cattle. Then Paris left the hills and came down into Troy, seeking his bull. And there Hecuba, his mother, chanced to see him, and knew by his likeness to his brothers, and by something in her own heart, that he was the son she had thought dead and lost to her in his babyhood. 
So let's take a look what's going on here on this next page. Hecuba knew, Queen Hecuba knew this was her son. Oh, I'm not a mom, but I'm telling you there's something about moms. They just know things, right? She wept for joy and brought him before the king. And seeing him living and so good to look upon, all men forgot the prophecy. And Priam welcomed him into the family and gave him a house of his own, like each of the other Trojan princes. There he lived whenever he would, but at other times he would be away back to the oak woods of Mount Ida, to his love, Enoni. And so things went on happily enough for a while. But meantime, across the Aegean Sea, another wedding had taken place, the marriage of King Menelaus of Sparta to the Princess Helen, whom men called Helen of the Fair Cheeks, the most beautiful of all mortal women. Her beauty was famous throughout the kingdoms of Greece, and many kings and princes had wished to marry her, among them Odysseus, whose kingdom was the rocky island of Ithaca. Her father would have none of them, but gave her to Menelaus. Yet, because he feared trouble between her suitors at a later time, he caused them all to swear that they would stand with her husband for her sake, if ever he had need of them. And between Helen and Odysseus, who married her cousin Penelope and loved her well, there was a lasting friendship that stood her in good stead when she had sore need of a friend years afterward. Even beyond the farthest bounds of Greece, the fame of Helen's beauty traveled, until it came at last to Troy, as Aphrodite had known that it would. And Paris no sooner heard of her than he determined to go and see for himself if she was indeed as fair as men said. Enoni wept and begged him to stay with her, but he paid no heed, and his feet came no more up the track to her woodland cave. If Paris wanted a thing, then he must have it. So he begged a ship from his father, and he and his companions set out. All the length of the Aegean Sea was before them, and the winds blew them often from their true course. But they came at last to their landfall, and ran the ship up the beach, and climbed the long hill tracks that brought them to the fortress palace of King Menelaus. So, a lot just happened. We learn about Helen of Troy. In case you didn't know about her, you're gonna learn today. She's the most beautiful woman ever. Okay, so like fictional stories, myths include elements such as settings, characters, and conflict. And if we pay attention to a character's traits or how they respond to plot events, we'll be able to describe the myth better. So if we look on lines 126 to 134, let's look at Paris's actions and what does it say about his character? So even though he has a faithful, beautiful partner, Inoni, the beautiful wood nymph, Paris is tempted by tales of Helen's beauty and decides to journey to see her. This tells readers that Paris is easily swayed by the idea of beauty. He has something good at home, but he got to go elsewhere to find it, okay? In lines 133 to 134, the texts say that if Paris wanted something, he must have it which tells readers that he's not a deep thinker, but headstrong and willful. He literally just said, I'm gonna go get what I want. How would that make Inoni feel for Inoni? She thought she was living her best life with him. And now here he goes, disappearing to go find Helen. And we're going to continue on this story. Slaves met them, as they met all strangers, in the outer court, and led them in to wash off the salt and the dust of the long journey. And presently, clad in fresh clothes, they were standing before the king in his great hall, where the fire burned on the raised hearth in the center, and the king's favorite hounds lay sprawled about his feet. Welcome to you, strangers, said Menelaus. Tell me now who you are and where you come from, and what brings you to my hall. I am a king's son, Paris by name, from Troy, far across the sea, Paris told him, and I come because the wish is on me to see distant places, and the fame of Menelaus has reached our shores as a great king and a generous host to strangers. 
Sit then and eat, for you must be way wary with such far traveling, said the king. And when they were seated, meat and fruit and wine in golden cups were brought in and set before them. And while they ate and talked with their host, telling the adventures of their journey, Helen the queen came in from the women's quarters, two of her maidens following, one carrying her baby daughter, one carrying her ivory spindle and distaff laden with wool of the deepest violet color. And she sat down on the far side of the fire, the women's side, and began to spin. And as she spun, she listened to the stranger's tales of his journeying. So let's pause for a second here. Let's see what we just took in. So, myths often involve a hero's journey, quest, or battle. Heroes are often leaders or warriors who possess admirable qualities, right? So if we reread lines 146 to 163, how can we tell that Paris is being honest with King Menelaus? And why is this important to the plot? Well, Paris isn't being honest, and he flatters the king, but does not tell the real motivation for his journey, which readers know is to meet Helen. This is important because Paris is hiding his fascination with Helen will anger the king and probably have harmful results. That's a safe bet to guess, right? And why did the ancient Greeks might have seen Paris as a hero? knowing that he's about to mess this up. Well, Paris is headstrong and willful, but he's also ambitious and determined. Those qualities might have been admirable to ancient Greeks. The heroes, gods, and goddesses had strengths and weaknesses, just as human beings do. Perfectly normal. And in little snatched glances, their eyes went to each other through the fronding hearth smoke. And Paris saw that Menelaus's queen was fairer even than the stories told, golden as a cornstalk and sweet as wild honey. And Helen saw, above all things, that the stranger prince was young. Menelaus had been her father's choice, not hers, and though their marriage was happy enough, he was much older than she was, with the first gray hairs already in his beard. There was no gray in the gold of Paris's beard, and his eyes were bright, and there was laughter at the corners of his mouth. Her heart quickened as she looked at him, and once, still spinning, she snapped the violet thread. Talk about tension. Am I right, folks? She said, this guy looks good. He's not that old fart that I'm with right now. Seems like a possible explanation for a lot of problems coming up let's keep going for many days paris and his companions remained the guests of king menelaus and soon it was not enough for paris to look at the queen poor enoni was quite forgotten and he did not know how to go away leaving helen of the fair cheeks behind so the days went by and the prince and the queen walked together through the cool olive gardens and under the white-flowered almond trees of the palace, and he sat at her feet while she spun her violet wool and sang her the songs of his own people. And then one day the king rode out hunting. Paris made an excuse not to ride with him, and he and his companions remained behind. And when they were alone together, walking in the silvery shade of the olives while his companions and her maidens amused themselves at a little distance, Paris told the queen that it was for sight of her that he had come so far, and that now he had seen her, he loved her to his heart's core and could not live without her. You should not have told me this, said Helen, for I am another man's wife, and because you have told me it will be the worse for me when you go away and must leave me behind. Honey sweet, said Paris, my ship is in the bay. Come with me now, while the king, your husband, is away from home. For we belong together, you and I, like two slips of a vine sprung from the same stock. And they talked together, on and on, through the hot noontide, with the crickets churring, he urging and she holding back. But he was Paris, who always got the things he wanted, and deep within her, her heart wanted the same thing. And in the end, she left her lord and her babe and her honor, and followed by his companions, with the maidens wailing and pleading behind them, 
He led her down the mountain paths and through the passes to his ship waiting on the seashore. So Paris had the bride that Aphrodite had promised him, and from that came all the sorrows that followed. Hold up. Paris has a lot of courage. I'm going to use that word. He has a lot of courage. And Helen, well, she left her daughter. She left her kid. She said, I'm going to go with this dude. Bye. Peace. Okay, so, whew. a theme is a message about life or human nature that the writer shares with the reader and they can summarize plot events to help determine a myth's theme, okay? So let's summarize the plot events on 194 to 213, that whole thing we just read. Paris's powers of persuasion finally convince Helen that they should be together, and she leaves her home and family to be with him. Bada bing, bada boom, just like that. This man showed up and he said, honey, you're the most beautiful thing in the world, and I want to take you home with me. Come with me, please. This woman said, sure. Okay. Now, lines 213, right there at the end. So Paris had the bride that Aphrodite had promised him. And from that came all the sorrows that followed. This suggests something about life and human behavior, that poor choices have far-reaching consequences. Sweet words can persuade another to make bad choices, and that the actions we take today have consequences for the future. He had the bride that Aphrodite promised him and all the sorrows that followed. Sorrows is sadness, okay? All the sadness that followed. This is going to be problematic if you ask me. Let's keep going. See what's going on here. Oh. Ship Gathering when Menelaus returned from hunting and found his queen fled with the Trojan prince, the black grief and the red rage came upon him, and he sent word of the wrong done to him, and a furious call for aid to his brother, black-bearded Agamemnon, who was high king over all the other kings of Greece. And from golden Mycenae of the Lion Gate, where Agamemnon sat in his great hall, the call went out for men and ships to ancient Nestor of Pylos, to Thisbe, where the wild doves croon, to rocky Pytho, to Ajax the mighty, lord of Salamis and Diomedes of the loud war cry, whose land was Argos of the many horses, to the cunning Odysseus among the harsh hills of Ithaca, even far south to Edomeneus of Crete, and many more. And from Crete and Argos and Ithaca, from the mainland and the islands, the black ships put to sea, as the kings gathered their men from the fields and the fishing, and took up bows and spears for the keeping of their oath, to fetch back Helen of the fair cheeks, and take vengeance upon Troy, whose prince had carried her away. Agamemnon waited for them with his own ships in the harbor of Aulis, and when they had gathered to him there, the great fleet sailed for Troy. But one of the war leaders who should have been with them was lacking, and this was the way of it. Before ever Paris was born, Thetis of the Silver Feet had given a son to King Peleus, and they called him Achilles. The gods had promised that if she dipped the babe in the Styx, which is one of the rivers of the underworld, the sacred water would proof him against death in battle. So, gladly she did as she was bidden, but dipping him head first in the dark and bitter flood, she held on to him by one foot. Thus her fingers, pressed about his heel, kept the waters from reaching that one spot. By the time she understood what she had done, it was too late, for the thing could not be done again. So ever after she was afraid for her son, always afraid." When he was old enough, his father sent him to Thessaly with an older boy, Patroclus, for his companion, to Chiron, the wisest of all the centaurs. And with the other boy, Chiron taught him to ride on his own back and trained him in all the warrior skills of sword and spear and bow, and in making the music of the lyre until the time came for him to return to his father's court. 
Whew. All right, so we got a lot of people introduced here. I'm not gonna even name them all, okay? Achilles is the name you all recognize and all know. Mm -hmm. So let's focus on the story a little bit. So readers can determine a theme by thinking about the lesson a myth points out. So let's look at lines 237 to 249. Why did Thetis do this? That she dips her infant son Achilles into the waters of the Styx so that he will not die in battle. Seems pretty legit, right? If the gods warned you, said, look, just give your baby a dump in this river and he'll be good to go forever. Okay. So what happened here? She holds him by his heel. Okay. She holds the little baby by his heel. And that area never got protected. Whew. That is scary. So imagine you are told that your son is going to be protected forever as long as you put him in this water. But oops, you forgot about his heel. So what theme or lesson are we seeing here? You know, like the same one that Paris's parents sent him away to. And why did they send him away? And why did she dump this baby in the river? These myths or les lessons they sound similar. They can't change fate. So even though they sent Paris away, he came back and stir that pot, okay? It's useless to try to protect children from future, from their own future, whatever it is, okay? We can also see that lessons can be passed from generation to generation. So the Achilles heel in line 245 to 249. The expression Achilles heel refers to someone's weak spot or vulnerability. This text explains how this expression originated in this myth of Achilles being dipped in the river sticks for protection. Everywhere except his heel. I'm sure some of you have heard it. Oh, that's so-and-so's Achilles heel. For example, my Achilles heel is chocolate. Oh my goodness, I love chocolate. What I wouldn't do for some chocolate. That is my weakness. See how that works? Let's keep it moving. Ooh, we got a nice warrior on a chariot. Oh, it's Achilles on a chariot. Look at that. Look at that. But when the High King's summons went out and the black ships were launched for war, his mother sent him secretly to the Isle of Skyros, begging King Lycomedes to have him dressed as a maiden and hidden among his own daughters so that he might be safe. How it came about that Achilles agreed to this, no one knows. Maybe she cast some kind of spell on him, for love's sake. But there he remained among the princesses, while the ships gathered in the world outside. But Thetis's loving plan failed after all, for, following the seaways eastward, part of the fleet put in to take on fresh water at Skyros, where the whisper was abroad that Prince Achilles was concealed. King Lycomedes welcomed the warriors, but denied all knowledge of the young prince. The leaders were desperate to find him, for Calchas, chief among the soothsayers who sailed with them, had said that they would not take Troy without him. Then Odysseus, who was not called the resourceful for nothing, blackened his beard and eyebrows, and put on the dress of a traitor, turning his hair up under a seaman's red cap, and with a staff in one hand and a huge pack on his back, went up to the palace. When the girls heard that there was a traitor in the palace forecourt, out from the women's quarters they all came running, Achilles among them, veiled like the rest, to see him undo his pack. So, Achilles' mom said, please don't take my child to war, he doesn't need to go to war, etc., etc., etc. Somehow they concealed him as a woman. Hey. <sighs> so, Authors show the importance of characters in different ways. Let's reread lines 257 to 278, okay? Why is Achilles important to this myth? In lines 273 to 274, Calchas, a soothsayer, had said that the fleet would not take Troy without Achilles. 
they need this man to take the city of Troy. They will not go unless they have the best warrior with them. Now, how is this connected to earlier depictions of Achilles, to the, the plot events? So if you look at lines 237 to 238, the author says that a leader was lacking from the fleet, and this was the way of it. The story of Thetis and Achilles follows, which tells readers that Achilles will be important in some way. So he foreshadowed it, okay? So we have Achilles, we have Paris, we have Helen, we have King Melanaeus, Agamemnon, oof, powerful dude. You know, the king of all Greeks. Yeah, it's a big deal. And when he had done so, each of them chose what she liked best, a wreath of gold, a necklace of amber, a pair of turquoise earrings blue as the sky, a skirt of embroidered scarlet silk, until they came to the bottom of the pack. And at the bottom of the pack lay a great sword of bronze, the hilt studded with golden nails. Then the last of the girls, still closely veiled, who had held back as though waiting all the while, swooped forward and caught it up, as one well used to the handling of such weapons. And at the familiar feel of it, the spell that his mother had set upon him dissolved away. This is for me, said Prince Achilles, pulling off his veil. Then the kings and chieftains of the fleet greeted and rejoiced over him. They stripped off his girl's garments and dressed him in kilt and cloak as befitted a warrior, with his new sword slung at his side, and they sent him back to his father's court to claim the ships and the fighting men that were his by right, that he might add them to the fleet. His mother wept over him, saying, I had hoped to keep you safe for the love I bear you, but now it must be for you to choose. If you bide here with me, you shall live long and happy." If you go forth now with the fighting men, you will make for yourself a name that shall last while men tell stories round the fire, even to the ending of the world. But you will not live to see the first gray hair in your beard, and you will come home no more to your father's hall. Short life and long fame for me, said Achilles, fingering his sword. So his father gave him fifty ships, fully manned, and Patroclus to go with him for his friend and sword companion. And his mother, weeping still, armed him in his father's armor, glorious war gear that Hephaestus, the smith of the gods, had made for him. And he sailed to join the black ships on their way to Troy. Whew, that's a lot of information, a lot of crazy nonsense that these people are talking about in a myth, okay? So, heroes are often important characters in Greek myths. If we examine a character's traits, of heroes, we can get a deeper understanding of the culture of ancient Greeks. So in lines 300 to 315, describe Achilles' decision and what it tells about his character. You know, what, what does it say moving forward? Even though he has been disguised, Achilles cannot conceal his true nature as a warrior because when he went to go pick that up, boom, it reminded him of picking up a sword. He cares less about being safe than making a name for himself. He wants to be famous. You can't be famous if you don't take risk. This establishes him as a hero, and it's an important character in the myth. So what was valued about this in ancient Greeks? Like, what did the ancient Greeks value about this? Bravery, a willingness to fight, probably is abhorrent. Having a long, safe life did not mean such to young men. Live fast, die young, right? That's the phrase. To Troy. Quarrel with the High King. The Greeks did not have smooth sailing. Storms beat them this way and that, and more than once they met with enemy fleets and had to fight them off. But at last they came in sight of the coast below Troy City. This is going to be fun. Then they made a race of it, the rowers quickening the oar beat, thrusting their ships through the water, each eager to come first to land. The race was won by the ship of Prince Protesilus, but as the prince sprang ashore, an arrow from among the defenders took him in the throat, and he dropped just above the tide line. The first of the Greeks to come ashore 
the first man to die in the long war for Troy. The rest followed him and quickly drove back the Trojan warriors, who were ill-prepared for so great an enemy war host. And when that day's sun went down, they were masters of the coastwise dunes and reed beds and rough grass that fringed the great plain of Troy. They beached their ships and built halls and huts in front of them to live in, so that in a while there was something like a seaport town. And in that town of turf and timber they lived while year after year of war went by. Nine times the wild almonds flowered and fruited on the rocky slopes below the city. Nine times summer dried out the tamarisk scrub among the grave mounds of long-dead kings. The ship's timbers rotted, and the high fierce hopes that the Greeks had brought with them grew weary and dull-edged. They knew little of siege warfare. They did not seek to dig trenches round the city, nor to keep watch on the roads by which supplies and fighting men of allied countries might come in. Nor did they try to break down the gates or scale the high walls. And the Trojans, ruled by an old king and a council of old men, remained for the most part within their city walls, or came out to skirmish only a little way outside them, though Hector, their war leader and foremost among the king's sons, would have attacked and stormed the Greek camp if he had had his will. All right, there's a lot going on here. Let's, let's see what's happening. So... In order to describe a myth, you can identify conflicts and examine its resolution. In lines 327 to 350, what's going on here? The Greeks arrive to do battle with Troy. They take over the coast. All right, so we have the city, Troy, coastline. Greeks are all here. They're all, they're all hanging out. However, because they know little of siege warfare. They didn't dig a trench. They spend nine years at the coast. Let's think about that. You are going to battle and you gotta wait nine years right there, right there, before you can even do anything about it because Troy has huge walls. You try to climb it, they're gonna shoot you down with arrows. The Trojans stay inside their city walls. This tells us that the conflict remains unresolved. So, Iris, the goddess of discord, drops an apple into this party she wasn't invited to and said it belongs to the fairest. Then you have three goddesses arguing over this apple. They argue for it for a very long time. And then go to Paris, and they say, Paris, pick which apple, who, who this apple belongs to. And then Paris picks Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty. What happens? He hears about Helen, the most beautiful woman, and steals her from another man. And then that man's brother happens to be the king of the Greeks. And so he calls forth everybody and their mom to come siege war on Troy, okay? And for nine years, this, all these, this company of men ready to fight are just chilling at the seashore. It's ridiculous. Had his will. But there were other lesser cities along the coast that were easier prey, and the men of the black ships raided these and drove off their cattle for food and their horses for the chariots that they had built, and the fairest of their women for slaves. On one of these raids far down the coast, when the almond trees were coming into flower for the tenth time, they captured and brought back two beautiful maidens, Chryseus and Briseis, among the spoils of war. Chryseus was given to Agamemnon, who as high king always received the richest of the plunder, while Briseis was awarded to Achilles, who had led the raid. Can we talk about that for a second? They stole, kidnapped, abducted these women, and gave them to these other men as a prize. Chryseus' father, who was a priest of Apollo, the sun god, followed and came to the Greek camp, begging for his daughter back again, and offering much gold for her ransom. But Agamemnon refused, and bade the old man be gone, with cruel insults. Mm. And there it seemed that the thing was ended. But soon after, fever came upon the Greek camp, 
Many died, and the smoke of the death fires hung day and night along the shore, and in despair the Greeks begged the soothsayer Calchas to tell them the cause of the evil. And Calchas watched the flight of birds and made patterns in the sand, and told them that Apollo, angry on behalf of his priest, was shooting arrows of pestilence into the camp from his silver bow, and that his anger would not be cooled until the maiden Chryseis was returned to her father. On hearing this, Agamemnon fell into a great rage, and though the other leaders urged him to release the girl, he swore that if he did so, then he would have Briseis out from Achilles' hall in her place. Then Achilles, who had grown to care for Briseis, would have drawn his sword to fight for her. But grey-eyed Athene, who was for the Greeks because Aphrodite was for Paris and the Trojans, put it into his mind that no man might fight the high king, and that all manner of evils, from defeat in battle to bad harvests, would come of it if he did. Even so, a bitter quarrel flared between them, though wise old Nestor tried to make peace. Achilles, who despite his youth was the proudest and hottest-hearted of all the Greek leaders, called Agamemnon a greedy coward with the face of a dog and the heart of a deer. It is small part you play in the fighting, but you take other men's prizes from them when the fighting is over, robbing them of the reward and the honor that is rightfully theirs, for this one reason that you have the power to do it, because you are the High King. I am the High King! agreed Agamemnon, his face blackening as though a storm cloud gathered over it. I have the power, even as you say, and let you not forget it. Also, as high king, I have the right, and let you not forget that either, you who are no more than a prince among other princes. The quarrel roared on, despite all that the other leaders could do to stop it. Whoa. Okay. I have a lot of opinions. We're going to skip that part. Let's carry on. So to describe a myth, we should note what the main characters are like and how they respond to plot events. So if we see lines 388 to 400, let's see about Achilles' character here and his conflict with Agamemnon. Achilles is young, but the proudest and hottest hearted of all the Greek leaders. And Achilles insults Agamemnon, calling him a greedy coward because he is proud and doesn't think he should lose Briseis, just because Agamemnon is high king. He's like, uh, I won her, she's mine, you can't take her. And then Agamemnon, what does it say about the Greeks? And was it wise to make conflict with kings? The high king's angered response saying that Achilles is no more than a prince among other princes, that shows that although brave warriors were valued in ancient Greeks, they would be foolish to insult a king in this way. I'm going to tell you right now, both parties are wrong because women are not property. But in the Greek myths, this is how they were perceived. So he's the high king and he thinks he can own everything. And unfortunately, that's how it was. That's how it was. And in the end, it was Achilles who had the final word. Lord Agamemnon, you have dishonored me, and therefore now I swear on all the gods that I will fight for you no more. Nor will I take any part in this struggle against Troy until my honor is made good to me again. And he strode out from the council gathering and went back to his own part of the camp, his own hall and his own black ships, and all the men of his own country with him. Then Agamemnon, in a black and silent rage, caused Chryseis to be put into one of his ships, and cattle with her for a sacrifice to Apollo, and ordered Odysseus to take command of the ship and return the girl to her father. And as soon as the ship had sailed, he sent his heralds to fetch Briseis from Achilles' hall and bring her to his own. Achilles made no more attempt to resist, and stood by as though turned to stone while the girl was led weeping away. But when she was gone, he went down to the cold seashore and flung himself down upon the tide line and wept his heart away. This man cried for her. I'd be upset too. So when we summarize the plot events, we can help determine the theme and describe other themes of the myth. 
lines 404 to 421, Achilles declares that he will no longer fight for King Agamemnon. He said, nah, dude, I ain't gonna fight for you no more since you want to take my girl. Or in the Battle of Troy until his honor is restored because he slighted his honor. Oof. Still insulted, the high king commands Odysseus to take Croesus back to her father and orders Croesus be brought to him. And Achilles weeps and cries at the seashore for her. So what themes or lessons that the ancient Greeks might have taken from this myth? Um, it is not wise even for a prince like Achilles to anger a king or maybe that it is important to make a stand against injustice, even if it means losing your station. Achilles said, nah, fam, you ain't gonna do me like that. Mm -mm. Not a fan. And his mother, Thetis of the Silver Feet, heard the voice of his furious grief from her home in the crystal palaces of the sea. And she came up through the waters like a sea mist rising, no one seeing her except her son. Oof, Mama Dukes heard this poor boy cry. Let's see what else happens. And she sat down beside him and stroked his hair and his bowed shoulders and said, What bitter grief is this? Tell me the darkness that is in your heart. So, chokingly, Achilles told her what she asked, and in his grief and bitter fury he demanded that she go to Zeus the Thunderer, chief of all the gods, and pray him for a Trojan victory that should make the high king feel the loss of his greatest captain and do him honor and beg for his return. Thetis promised that she would do as he asked, but it could not be done at once, for the father of the gods was absent about some matter in the far most part of his world, and it must wait for his return to Olympus. So for twelve days Achilles remained by his ships, waiting and brooding on his wrongs. And Odysseus, having returned Chryseus to her father with the proper sacrifices and prayers and purification, came again to the ship strand with the promise that Apollo was no longer set against them and had lifted the plague curse away. But still Briseus wept in the hall of the high king, and Achilles sat among his ships, nursing his anger as though it were a red rose in his breast. Whew, that is some hot tea. So, let's review. Authors sometimes use imagery to help readers understand the meaning of the story, okay? So if we look at those last lines, 445 to 446, there's a simile here, and this simile helps us understand Achilles' feelings. The simile is nursing his anger as though it were a red rose in his breast. This tells us that Achilles is still angry. He is keeping his anger alive. The, the way he might care for a red rose and keep it growing. The Red Rose also helps reader connect Achilles' anger with his love for Briseis, which makes his feelings of love and anger crystal clear. That is some strong imagery, okay? It's practically poetry. Woo! On page 328, you are going to answer questions one through seven. Yes, you are. And on page 329, you're going to answer questions one through four. And the other one through four. So that's a total of eight questions. You're going to answer those questions for me. Okay, guys? So that's all for now for the Black Ships Before Troy. Any questions, email me, send me a message or a mine, put in the comments. Okay? Alrighty. Bye-bye.